In the shadows of human history, a whispered Latin phrase echoes through time, carrying a message as inevitable as it is profound, memento mori. Remember that you will die. Born in the grandeur of the Roman Empire, where it served as a humbling reminder to victorious generals, Memento Mori has woven its way through the tapestry of time, crossing cultures, religions, and art forms. In the Middle Ages, this solemn reminder became a cornerstone of Christian thought, an ever-present counsel to focus not on the fleeting pleasures of the earth, but on the eternal journey of the soul. As empires rose and fell, as art and philosophy evolved, Memento Mori persisted, a reflection of humanity's enduring contemplation of mortality and the search for meaning in the face of our transient existence. The philosopher Democritus trained himself by going into solitude and frequenting tombs. Plato's Phaedo, where the death of Socrates is recounted, introduces the idea that the proper practice of philosophy is about nothing else but dying and being dead. The Stoics of classical antiquity were particularly prominent in their use of this discipline, and Seneca's letters are full of injunctions to meditate on death. The Stoic Epictetus told his students that when kissing their child, brother, or friend, they should remind themselves that they are mortal, curbing their pleasure, as do those who stand behind men in their triumphs and remind them that they are mortal. The Stoic Marcus Aurelius invited the reader, himself, to consider how ephemeral and mean all mortal things are in his meditations. In some accounts of the Roman triumph, a companion or public slave would stand behind or near the triumphant general during the procession and remind him from time to time of his own mortality or prompt him to look behind. Accounts from Judaism. Several passages in the Old Testament urge a remembrance of death. In Psalm 90, Moses prays that God would teach his people to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Psalms 90, 12. In Ecclesiastes, the preacher insists that it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Ecclesiastes 7-2. In Isaiah, the lifespan of human beings is compared to the short lifespan of grass. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. Isaiah 47. In early Christianity, the expression memento mori developed with the growth of Christianity, which emphasized heaven, hell, Hades, and salvation of the soul in the afterlife. The second century Christian writer Tertullian claimed in his Apologeticus that during a triumphal procession, a victorious general had someone standing behind him, holding a crown over his head and whispering, Respice poste, hominem te esse memento, memento mori. Look after yourself. Remember you're a man. Remember you will die. Though in modern times this has become a standard trope, in fact, no other ancient authors confirm this, and it may have been Christian moralizing on Tertullian's part rather than an accurate historical report, Christian theology. The thought was then utilized in Christianity, whose strong emphasis on divine judgment, heaven, hell, and the salvation of the soul brought death to the forefront of consciousness. In the Christian context, the memento mori acquires a moralizing purpose quite opposed to the Nunc est bibendum, now is the time to drink, theme of classical antiquity. To the Christian, the prospect of death serves to emphasize the emptiness and fleetingness of earthly pleasures, luxuries, and achievements, and thus also as an invitation to focus one's thoughts on the prospect of the afterlife. A biblical injunction often associated with the memento mori in this context is, in omnibus operibus tuis memorare, novissima tua et in aeternum non peccabis, the Vulgate's Latin rendering of Ecclesiasticus 740, in all thy works be mindful of thy last end and thou wilt never sin. This finds ritual expression in the rites of Ash Wednesday, when ashes are placed upon the worshippers' heads with the words, Remember, man, that you are dust and unto dust, you shall return. 
Memento Mori has been an important part of ascetic disciplines as a means of perfecting the character, by cultivating detachment and other virtues, and by turning the attention towards the immortality of the soul and the afterlife. The most obvious places to look for Memento Mori meditations are in funeral art and architecture. Perhaps the most striking to contemporary minds is the transi or cadaver tomb, a tomb that depicts the decayed corpse of the deceased. This became a fashion in the tomes of the rich in the 15th century, and surviving examples still offer a stark reminder of the vanity of earthly riches. Later, tombstones in the United States frequently depicted winged skulls, skeletons, or angels snuffing out candles. These are among the numerous themes associated with skull imagery. Another example of memento mori is provided by the chapels of bones, such as the Capella dos Ossos in Evora, or the Capuchin Crypt in Rome. These are chapels where the walls are totally or partially covered by human remains, mostly bones. The entrance to the Capella dos Ossos has the following sentence, We bones, lying here bare, await yours. Timepieces have been used to illustrate that the time of the living on Earth grows shorter with each passing minute. Public clocks would be decorated with mottos such as Ultima Forsan, perhaps the last hour, or Vulnerant Omnis, Ultima Nikat, they all wound and the last kills. Clocks have carried the motto Tempus Fugit, Time Flees. Old striking clocks often sported automata who would appear and strike the hour. Some of the celebrated automaton clocks from Augsburg, Germany, had death striking the hour. Private people carried smaller reminders of their own mortality. Mary, Queen of Scots, owned a large watch carved in the form of a silver skull, embellished with the lines of Horace. Pale death knocks with the same tempo upon the huts of the poor and the towers of kings. In the late 16th and through the 17th century, memento mori jewelry was popular. Items included mourning rings, pendants, lockets, and brooches. These pieces depicted tiny motifs of skulls, bones, and coffins, in addition to messages and names of the departed, picked out in precious metals and enamel. During the same period, there emerged the artistic genre known as vanitas, Latin for emptiness or vanity. Especially popular in Holland and then spreading to other European nations, Vanitas paintings typically represented assemblages of numerous symbolic objects such as human skulls, guttering candles, wilting flowers, soap bubbles, butterflies, and hourglasses. Memento Mori is also an important literary theme. Well-known literary meditations on death in English prose include Sir Thomas Brownie's Hydriotaphia, Urn Burial, and Jeremy Taylor's Holy Living and Holy Dying. These works were part of a Jacobean cult of melancholia that marked the end of the Elizabethan era. In the late 18th century, literary elegies were a common genre. Thomas Gray's elegy, written in a country churchyard, and Edward Young's night thoughts are typical members of the genre. In the European devotional literature of the Renaissance, the Ars Moriendi, Memento Mori had moral value by reminding individuals of their mortality. Apart from the genre of requiem and funeral music, there is also a rich tradition of memento mori in the early music of Europe, especially those facing the ever-present death during the recurring bubonic plague pandemics from the 1340s onward, tried to toughen themselves by anticipating the inevitable in chance, from the simple Geisler leader of the flagellant movement to the more refined claustral or courtly songs. The lyrics often looked at life as a necessary and God-given veil of tears with death as a ransom, and they reminded people to lead sinless lives to stand a chance at Judgment Day. The Danse Macabre is another well-known example of the Memento Mori theme, with its dancing depiction of the Grim Reaper carrying off rich and poor alike. This and similar depictions of death decorated many European churches. We notice a similar theme in other beliefs, where people are reminded about the unavoidable death, and in some cultures death are celebrated as the important scenario of life itself. As we part ways, may the ancient wisdom of Memento Mori accompany you, not as a shadow of dread, but as a beacon of clarity and purpose. In remembering our mortality, 
we find a deeper appreciation for the gift of life and the interconnectedness of our shared human journey. Thanks for watching.